Welcome back to the Nassiman Hockey Podcast. James Nichols, John Zeller here with you uh, after a victory by the New York Islanders in Game 5. Uh, before we get to that, James, you, you finished a tattoo recently, and I forget what it was, a Power Ranger? I'm, <laughs> I'm forgetting. I feel like I could say any kind of character and it would be right. That's, okay. Fair. But, um... Yeah, so the I didn't finish it. it. I did my second session. It's gonna need a third, uh, but it does have color now. I did tweet it out because um, you know apparently some people on Twitter are curious, and that's super cool. Um, yeah, so it is of this character that was created yeah. actually through a comic book adaption. Um, it I combines think you said that, two. Yeah. It combines my favorite character in uh, two of his different forms in uh, Tommy Oliver, the the White Ranger, and the Green Ranger. Um, makes him quote unquote Lord Draken, who is evil, and I love every second of how cool that storyline is. So, um, yeah, he's a uh, badass looking sitting on a throne, and I put it right on my shin because why not? That's a tough spot from what I've yeah, it heard. It sucks, it sucks. The, I mean, the lining actually was easier than the shading, usually, it's reverse mm-hmm. for me. Um, but the lining was definitely easier. The shading at one point. She said to me, uh, my, this is my artist, she was like, we have to call it quits right now because your skin uh, doesn't want to do this anymore. She's like, yeah. it's pushing out the ink. And I was like, okay, uh, it definitely sucks. So I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, recently thinking about finishing a couple of ideas and I was uh, you know, writing down in my notes app all different things. I have list, a whole folder on instagram of of saved tattoos and, and different ideas i was i was chatting with a buddy of mine who does some of my tattoos so we're i'm probably just gonna wait to the fall although i really kind of want to just do it now um i typically after march i typically don't get any um just yeah. the sun in the summer although it we, we've had bursts of summer and spring so far here in yep, central new york um but it's primarily been pretty chilly still um so i kind of feel silly for for waiting because it's quote spring um but yeah i'm I'm in the same boat uh i I have a couple spots on my arm that i'm really not looking forward to and the person that's going to do it has a pretty heavy hand now as he says i make it stick but (laughs) it's it's uncomfortable um i'll have to power through it it's going to be a bunch of not small ones, but like mid-sized ones on my forearm. So I'm not necessarily excited about that. Um, but we're back. We're here now. We have a lot of Islanders hockey to talk about. Um, we do. Five, five games to be exact as they head back to Long Island for game six, um, which is a little exciting. And I, maybe we can get to that in a little bit. But I wanted to just get your overall thoughts on how the Islanders got here. And and. You can answer that however you want. I think it's it's fairly open ended. I I have a way that I I want to answer it, but I want to hear um, your interpretation of the question. Yeah, so uh, they got here, in my opinion, in two different well, not different, but in two ways as a whole. Um, one was obviously Game Five. Sorokin was great. So you're gonna talk it. You're gonna chalk it up to to goaltending for Game Five. Um, some questionable goals against for him in uh, a couple times before Game Five, but he was really good in Game Five. They needed him to be, and and he was. He was he was very Sorokin. Not no crazy highlight reel saves, but he made the good ones. Um, you know, and 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 two, they go down to nothing. They need to win Game Three to sever the momentum. Um, and and all the talk after Game Two was that although. You know the the hurricanes were up in the series. The Islanders were doing damage, right? Um, you know, they're, if they're not going to beat you, they're at least going to beat you up, and that's exactly what they have been doing. You know, you you see Jack Drury got hurt. Um, you know, because of just how physical of a battle this has become, and you know they go into Game Three after you know not receiving some some calls that they probably should have re- received, questionable officiating, and, and that Game Three was so emotional, right? First game at UBS Arena. They're, they're playing with their hearts on their sleeves. And yes, they're they're obviously frustrated with the officiating. Um, but they're also, you know, very emotional about wanting to take a game in the series and stay in the fight. And they do. 
uh, which, which game three was, was a great game for them. Um, one that you you thought that they would ride the wave of momentum there. The talk after game three became, yeah, they're down in the series, but are they in the driver's seat? Another game at UBS Arena to go. Um, you know, the 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 Hurricanes are are limping through this series. Feels like the Islanders have the momentum, right? So, unfortunately, game four comes and they they are just dreadful, dreadful. Uh, and then game five comes with their with their backs against the wall, their season on the line, and and once again pull another uh, another emotional victory out of a hat. So uh, they they have won their games and got to this point based on goaltending and you know the the pride of the veterans, the emotion of 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 the Islanders. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see how game six goes, just because again you know we've seen how the Islanders can come into one game and and just grind out this win and then in the very next game just lay an egg i think that i think that's a that's a very well said recap of how they how the islanders kind of got here and then the you know setting up our conversation for where they can go from here i i had it summed up um not as eloquently and not nearly uh many words i just have one word and it was luck um, this is not, I, I think outside of that two minute span, and I think the Islanders by and large have played maybe 10 minutes, a dozen minutes in this series of good hockey all together. And if you add it up and you got to think they scored four quick goals, I don't know. Yes, they win that game, but I don't know if you looked at that game, you know, everyone's posting, you're doing this for the other series. Uh, the Devils and the Rangers and other things, and uh, other people are posting the deserve it win meter And I don't really chalk anything up to that. I don't think anyone is, especially in the playoffs and in, in today's NHL. There's a lot of parody, blah, blah, blah. But it's been a lot of luck. Th- this is not a team anymore that is capitalizing on mistakes. Carolina is out islandering the Islanders. That's how the Islanders play. They don't quite control the puck the same way, but they do capitalize on mistakes, or at least that was the identity of the Islanders or part of their identity um, over the last number of years. And, and even this season, the, the third period comebacks and that kind of gritty style in this series, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing an Islander team that's able to take advantage of the mistakes, partly because and this isn't knock so much against the Islanders so much as Carolina is good. They have very mobile defensemen. Um, their forwards get back. They're very structured. Again, this is what we saw in the last series against the Hurricanes in 2019. They got out islanded by the Canes. They just played their game better at that point. And then we just, you know, I can't remember what the regular season looked like over the next few years because COVID and, and whatnot. But even still, I, I, I'm getting that vibe that, this team is, you know, it's like, like the Muddy Ducks thing. They're bigger, they're stronger, they have more facial hair. Uh, <clears throat> and the Islanders have just kind of fallen victim to that. So, yes, are they beating up on the Canes a bit? Are an already hurt Carolina team that it's without Tara Vine and I believe, and maybe even a couple other people before the series started, um, Patchy Ready, and maybe even somebody else. So there was a number of players that, you know, they were missing even before they, they got Andre Svechnikov, who's there. Svechnikov as well, right. So Probably you know, best player. So for the Islanders to not really be able to handle that and Sorokin not playing his best, maybe until last game, I think it's a lot of luck that they're that they're in the series. That Engvall finally capitalized right on that mistake. Um Right. And, and score the team's first goal, their first first period goal, and whatever doesn't really even matter. If they, they were if I can so long, interject, but... if if I can just interject for a second, right? Just taking a look at you know the injuries for the Carolina Hurricanes, it's uh, Jake Gardner and Andre Kosh. Okay, you know a, a couple of depth defensemen and, and forwards here, but further, it's Max Pacioretty, Andre Svechnikov, Tavo Taravainen, who broke his hand in this series. Uh, and Jack Drury, who is a, a rookie who's playing pretty well for them. They also have Shane Gossis Bear as a game-time decision and Mackenzie McKeeran 
um, who is another game time decision for them. Uh, McKieran is he's a good player. Uh, he's playing on their first line right now, probably just because of the number of injuries. Uh, but still, you know, he's their next best guy who's going to play on the first line. And he's also questionable. Right. So, look, the Islanders have played their brand of hockey and they have done damage clearly. Right. Took out Tara Vinen, and And this wasn't with intent, but they took out Tara Vinen. They took out um, Jack Drury, possibly. You know, uh, uh, McCarron is, is is a game time decision. Shane Goss's bear is hurting. Right. This is this is what the Islanders are going to do. So uh, they have. Definitely, and this is something that I spoke about with with uh, a couple of people the other day. They have definitely, um, you know, made inserted their their or or asserted themselves in this series, I should say, uh, in a way. Sometimes they get away from that. Um, one of the ways they they've been getting away from that too is, in my opinion, uh, before up to game five, you know, the first four games, they were far too worried about the officiating. And and not worried enough about the hurricanes, right? And there, they were controlling themselves. I, I think that's a uh, that's one of the things about Game Four coming out of that win. There were so many. There were a lot of calls. I, I'm surprised at the lack of calls in Game Five. Frankly, not to say that there weren't any penalties. Um, everyone loved the joke on ESPN about both Ajos being in the box at the same time. Um, really, really love the joke. Very original. Um, there weren't nearly as many calls, but even, even they were saying like, you know, they, as in Parise and some of the players that it, it wasn't necessarily the officiating as, as a problem so much as, you know, and maybe he's putting some words in their mouth, but they need to calm down Two Martin penalties that were unnecessary. And it was just them not. They were rattled. They just they, they couldn't get to any part of their game. The defense has not looked good. They Pulak and Pelek are split up outside of maybe um, the penalty kill and or late in games. Dobson looks like horse shit, and I just kind of on another level. I'm not I'm not understanding his decision making at any point uh, in the series. Kind of topped off by a power play misread and just kind of dropping that puck right into a Carolina Hurricanes skate. But yeah, and we could talk about the officiating and it's been a problem, I think, throughout the entire playoffs, like every series. But the Islanders gotta calm down. They gotta play their game. Right. right? And well they, that beginning of game four, that minute or up until that Parise penalty, which in and of itself isn't a problem. Even in the Pulak penalty was a penalty. Fine. It doesn't mean – I mean, it kills a little bit of your momentum, but they just were off their game after that. They had the momentum to start, and right. they just could not regain it. That's not an officiating problem. That's – Right, between, well, and this – continues to be a between-years problem. Correct, and this was, this was going to be my point. It was not that the Islanders are being hindered by the officiating, which – if you know, okay, yeah, you can make the argument that they, that they are. However, you can't – you can't reverse the unreviewable calls, right? You can bark at the ref as much as you want. It's not going to change. The call is the call. Stop focusing on the hurricanes. You want to voice your opinion. That wasn't a penalty. Let it be known for the rest of the game. Like the refs should maybe watch how they make these calls once. Sure. But the, 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 the majority of the game, they should not be doing that. Right? So my, my opinion on the matter was that they have focused their attention too much on the wrong opponent, the officiating and not, the hurricanes because instead now they're giving up power play goals they're not playing their their usual four man special teams penalty killing uh, uh game where they're actually pretty good at killing penalties no instead they're giving up two two of five uh oh in, my, in a the, game the and they're is, losing it's just i th- so many times at least i can remember a handful of times i'm sure it's more but just carolina hurricanes players alone in front back door just no one even remotely close. And that's that's just those types of players. There's, there's been others just in front of the net where untouched Canes players be able to get position and, and make a make a tip or get in front of Sorokin's eyes. And yeah, Sorokin's, uh, you know, a couple of those you hope he have, he'd have them. And only because 
not because every goalie would, but he's done it. And all of a sudden, he, he's not. And the rest of your team's got to be prepared in front of him. I, I'm not – their their focus isn't there. Like I said, they've played about 10 or 12 minutes of good hockey, maybe the entire series. They're, they're just not – focused and you know and I've said this before I should just want a Kerr's article that that also said this you know in the playoffs it's usually your top you, you know, your stars cancel each other out but in in this series it's it's been really the Islanders middle six carrying the mail to the point where Lane actually had to make an adjustment and and switched that up a little bit so Horvat and Barzell, outside of the two-on-one goal that they connected on, um, that put the Islanders up, I believe that was 3-1, became the game-winning goal. Um, Horvat and Pajot have switched. And it didn't, you know, it didn't really look great, if I, if I have to be honest. I wanted to get your opinion on how the lines look to you after this after the switch. What did you what did you think about that? Well, you're right about the the offense running through the middle of the pack there, right? The the majority of it is coming from Engvall, which was mostly just last game, actually, but Palmieri and Nelson. Um, and, and that's a huge problem. You know, you, you looked at before game five, Anders Lee, Matthew Barzell, and Bo Horvat all only had one goal each in the series, and that was it. No additional points. So three points coming from... Your, your top three players, if you will, in Anders Lee, Bo Horvat, and, and Matthew Barzell, versus when you look at the first line for the Hurricanes, who had nine points going into game five. It, that's a clear difference, right? Three points versus they, that's triple. So the Hurricanes' first line is getting triple the production that the Islanders' first line is getting, and we're sitting here wondering what's wrong. What's wrong is that the, the Islanders aren't getting the, the production that's supposed to be canceled out in the top six because the second line's doing it. The first line is not. So yeah, that's and a now those problem players, right now. There's big players that are now switched. And not only is right. Brazil still trying to get his footing, but and, and Peugeot and Barzell played together a little bit during the season when they were trying to figure out the top six and there were there were injuries. Frankly, I thought that they would run Sezikis there um, just to give him a boost because they did actually play super well together when yeah, that happened. Did. So I, I was kind of waiting for that just to give Sezikis a little more ice time, um, you know, up in the top six. I think that would really bolster that kind of the top nine. That's not necessarily a knock on Clutterbuck and Martin. Um They've kind of uh, caused more problems than they fix in this series so far, so I don't mind if Sezikis is uh, – that, that line as a whole isn't getting the ice time, but Sezikis is able to get up there a little bit. Um, I was going to – I think I had this question for later, um, you know, because we, we talked about – we can get back to, like, Engvall and, and that line kind of carrying the mail here, but is there anything else L- Lambert can do? Because there's no – I don't believe there are any black aces, so, like – that it, it, for people that don't know, um, typically there's a whole group of of players that a coach has access to um, because there's no salary cap in the playoffs, so you just have players around. I don't believe that's the case this time. I don't know if other teams aren't doing this too, especially yeah. the ones that don't have an AHL team in the playoffs. Is there anything Lane Lambert can do at this point other than, you know, is this, is in other words, or rather should he? You know, is it time to galaxy brain or is it it's game six? We we just won. Um, let's I don't I think that because they had two days off. So they might be practicing today as you're hearing this on Thursday before their game on Friday. Uh, maybe they're running lines, uh, getting used to Peugeot and Barzell again and, and trying to figure some of that out. But should there be any other changes going into game six? I mean, you know, you might have to ride the hot hand here and throw, you know, Kyle Palmieri on the first power play. I, I feel like that would definitely be something that they could try, right? Anders Lee, yeah, he's the net front presence on that first unit, but Kyle Palmieri can do that, and he's producing. Um, Noah Dobson has been dreadful on the power play. Maybe Sebastian Ajo can get bumped up to the first unit. Maybe they can try Ryan Pollock again. 
Um, you know, there are no black aces other than Jacob Skarik, but he's a goaltender. He's also the third string goaltender, and the goaltending well, is not the problem. So, yeah, thinking about five on five and and some of the lines because you have a good second line, you have a fourth line, so that you're you're really not dealing with a whole lot of options here, right? And then you can't if you were going to bring somebody out up if Lambert was going to ask Lamorello, hey, you know, we, we need another, I need at least one or two other options here. I'm not even sure how, who you take out of the lineup because Fashing has played well. Parise's played well. Um, it's real, and it's really not their fault where, where they're at. So Lee hasn't been very good either in this series on the whole, um, which is not something we've typically said about him. He's usually pretty right. consistent and you're not going to take the captain out of the lineup. He's not right. to and, the point where that's that's an option. Where, in other words, he's not old enough and washed up. Where you're like, all right, we can we can do without him. He would understand. Let's have that conversation. There really just aren't the options at this point. And you'd think and right. something that you said was when Barzell comes back, everyone has their right place. And I think that's true. It's just not working. I don't think right, no, this I, team, I agree. Like, you know, watching them, they've just, as you said, they have not been good. So, like, what what else can Lambert do at this point? I mean, I mean, looking at looking at the roster and the way it's set up, you, you really can't. You know, what are you gonna do? You're gonna break up Engball, Nelson, and Paul Mary, the only line at five on five that's producing for you? Are you gonna that's break up exactly the, the fourth I mean. you're gonna break up the fourth line who actually is playing like their former selves. I, I don't think you're going to do it. And I know you said earlier, you know, throw Sezekis on the same line as uh, uh, Barzell because they've shown chemistry in the past and I get it. But at the same time, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, they're, they're providing that, that boom, they're providing that energy. And, you know, that's, that's something that they, they are going to need. So the only thing that he could have done and he already did do was switch Horvat and Pajot. You know, Pajot went up to the first line between Lee and Barzell and Horvat went down between Parise and Fashing, and you know it, it was fine, but it, it you know it, it wasn't it didn't do anything. Like nothing came of it. The only thing that yeah. actually did happen was that Barzell and Horvat connected for a goal. And um, you know, look, maybe that's the, that's the um, you know that that breaks the dam open, and 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 more points start coming through. Who knows? Um, but to this point, like it's really tough. Like. Again, that second line, it's it's the one that's producing. You you, you have to keep it. Uh, you, you know, looking at the stats here for, for the Islanders, it's Nelson, Paul Mary, Scott Mayfield, Ryan Pollock, and then it's Barzell and Horvat, who only just crept up there in, in the pecking order in the last game because they each had a point. Nassim and Hockey is brought to you by DraftKings. Light the lamp during the hockey playoffs with DraftKings Sportsbook right now. New customers can make a $5 bet and score $150 in bonus bets instantly. You can go to DraftKings Sportsbook right now and place a prop bet on Brock Nelson to score a goal, and there's a pretty good chance that you're going to hit. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and sign up with code THPN. New customers can make a $5 hockey playoff bet and score $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's code THPN only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800-327-5050 or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-H-O-P-E-N-Y or text H-O-P-E-N-Y 467-369. In Kansas, call 1-800-522-4700. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for offer details. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Lambert can't necessarily be blamed for what's going on as far as a lineup. Like how because there's not much he can shake up. Yeah. And I, I think I've I've gotten a lot of pushback on Twitter, surprise. In no. You know, in, in saying that the leaders have to get leaders and, and, and the coach at, at some times have to get the players up for these games. And, and people have pushed back. And, and I don't think they're wrong is if you have to get if you have, someone has to get you up for a playoff game, you, you don't belong in the league. I don't necessarily disagree with that, but something's missing. 
like there there's something's happening on the the lead and i've said this all season just the the team's inability to kind of come together and stick to their game they're clearly rattled a little bit because you're not seeing them i don't know yes they're hitting but they're not the the hurricanes on the other hand maybe this is the right perspective they're just imposing their will on on the islanders they don't have a choice they 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 can only read and react they're not setting the tempo for the game outside of the beginning of game 4 they they're not setting the tempo for any of these games or shift to shift or any of the periods you're you're just seeing a team kind of run around and there's nothing seemingly nothing they can do about it you know it, so i kind of say all of that and i you know i kind of mentioned it before i just said it poorly is Lane coaching for his job and Lamarello's job at this point? Or is this, I don't know. Or I don't know what they would chalk it up to. I'm sure they'd come up with some excuse. But especially if they don't make it out of this series. Are they are they kind of all coaching and, and managing for their own jobs? Um, it's a good question. You know, I, I have my suspicions as as to if, you know, Lamorello is going to be back next year. I don't think what's going on in the playoffs is on Lane Lambert. You know, I think he's working with what he's got. Um, you know, everyone is quote unquote fully. No, I shouldn't say fully, but everyone is quote unquote healthy. Right. I think Barzell might still be dealing with a little bit of something. I think Romanov might still be dealing with a little bit of something, although Romanov uh, is playing really well. Um, but, you know. I have my suspicions as to whether or not Lambert, I mean, sorry, Lamorello will be back next season. And if he's not back and they bring in someone new, you know, I could see Lambert being gone just because whoever is new that comes in uh, will want, you know, his own guy behind the bench. So I, I don't blame what's going on on Lambert, but you, you know, if the Islanders don't make it out of this series, yeah, I could see a situation where things change. I mean, because they made it to the playoffs, and that's typically, you know, in a in a coach's first season, not making it out of the first round isn't going to get somebody fired. But there, there's just been something off. And, and to be fair, all the injuries last season, but this was something that has been a problem with this team for a long time as far as a lack of consistency. We saw that going into the 2020 playoffs in the bubble where by the end, they, they barely squeaked into playing in the playing round. They were playing really bad after they got Peugeot. Um, the following year really wasn't much better going into the playoffs. This year was much the same. They were not playing well or consistently at all going into the playoffs and not having any momentum and having, Horvat kind of fall off near the end, not having Barzell. Now they had to get caught up to speed together. Barzell just had to get back in, you know, his legs back in game shape. Apparently it was a lower body injury. Um, so what, whatever that means, it's going to affect his skating and he's, he's not been the same. He's, he's playing a little timid out there. He's Oh, and, and you know, one of the plays um, I think, on that Dobson giveaway, he just skates right by. He didn't stick a stick in the guy's legs, a potential trip and call. There was nothing. There was no – he's a leader. He's Save for Sorokin, he's supposed to be the best player on this team. And, and injury or not, there, there's – you're seeing Aho on the here, – here's us doing it. Aho on the, on the Canes take a puck to the face and then score a goal. That may have been the one that was called back, but he, he still he still, he still scored a goal. Actually, no, it was Nikas. Um, he scored another goal. I think it was the second one in Game Five for Carolina. He, he's going out there and doing what he's got to do. These players are on Carolina are playing beat up. Uh, there's just no excuse for where the Islanders are and what they're doing right now. Yeah, and and that's exactly what I mean. You know, like I said earlier, the. You, you said you you could cancel out the top sixes in in most series, right? Not this one. 
you know, th- this one is the one that, you know, the the Islanders top line, you know, the, the second line producing the Islanders top line is not. And that's really the, the crux of what's killing them right now. The bottom six is producing. And, and funny enough, the Islanders are outscoring the Hurricanes at five on five. It's the power play goals that that they're giving up. That's that's really hindering them. If and they can and fix not scoring the, on the power play. Right. So if they could fix the special teams on both ends, um, you know, that would be a huge boost. But also, you know, their top guys need to uh, start producing, because if you look at the Hurricanes in the playoffs, you have Sebastian Ajo with three goals, six points. You have uh, Seth Jarvis with two goals, four points. You have uh, Martin Nietzsche with a goal and three points. You have uh, Stefan Noison, who's he's a, he's a deaf guy, but he's got four points, um, you know, as opposed to scoring a lot of goals. Right, as opposed to the Islanders' first line, who has, I think, a total of five points altogether. That's it's, it's a it's it's clearly a, a mismatch here. Yeah, I mean, one of my one of my questions for for this, and it's just coming out of Game Five and and even and heading into Game Six, and I I tweeted this yesterday. I think from even from my personal account, which I don't I don't usually do as much, but. I thought if they won game five, they had a really good chance at home on Friday. Obviously, if they lose game five, that's it. The series is over. Um, So I know it seems a little weird to say that, but I thought if they can actually get the series back at home, and this is similar to the the second series against the Tampa Bay Lightning, um, it could be a similar story where they, they forced a game seven after a dramatic game six. Um, and it, it might feel a lot like that where they're kind of just playing for their lives. And maybe it's like a game five where they just stuck it out. They, they just found a way in, in general, good teams just find a way to win. But I wonder they, they, they managed to do it in, in, uh, in prettier fashion in, in game three, they get killed in game four. They come back pretty much get outplayed and but managed to win the game three two is this sustainable like even if they make it out of the first round are are the islanders beat up or do they not have the momentum maybe they win the series and that gives them all the momentum they need and they're they're a refreshed team but are they capable of like you got to think it's not just about game six at that point right you can't th- you have to look at it one game of a t- at a time to a large degree but then you got to do it again. And that's not yeah. in your own arena. Now you did just pull it off in game five. Right. To me, how they're playing this series, there's a reason they're down three to two playing for their lives the next three games. Look, Is the Islanders, I, I think the Islanders still have a shot at pulling this out. Fact of the matter, they have the best goaltender in the series, possibly the NHL. The fact that the fact of the matter is that that's a huge, huge reason why they can pull this out, right? Frederick Anderson can't stay healthy. Anti uh, Ranta has been good. He hasn't had to be great. Um, and they have a rookie as a third string guy if they need him. So um, if the Islanders can turn it on, even and I guess at this point, and maybe this is where you're going. Yeah. If Horvat and Barzell can just turn it on yes. for two games. And Sorokin it. plays like he did in Game Five. I, I that's not crazy. I think I'm I think I'm with you on that. I does they don't they didn't whatever they were until game <laughs> until Game Six, right? It's almost irrelevant. It does not matter what the the rest of the series was. It's just best out of one every single time. You know the next two games yeah. here. If it, if it goes two games, they just need to be the best team the next two games. Win, e- winning each period. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I think um, you're pulling me in with the optimism. I, I'm typically not. I'm typically not there. But I was, you know, I, there's a part of me that didn't think it was sustainable, but maybe two days off is what they need. They yeah, were... well, that, that was going to be my point, right? They're not playing today. They don't play tomorrow. They play Friday. Um, so it, it's it's possible they get a good two days rest. Like, I don't know how many guys skated today. I think it was optional. Um, regardless, you know, they get a couple days rest from, from in-game action. Just keep the legs a little fresh on the ice for the next two days. And then Friday comes and, you know, big game at UBS arena, 
fans. You know that the the fans are going to come. They're going to they're going to bring the emotion. Uh, the Islanders feed on that. You know, it's going to be a tough building for the Hurricanes to come and play in. It's a hostile environment, and and that's a factor. You know, whether whether people want to agree with it or not, it is. It's a factor, and it's going to be a hard game for the Hurricanes to come in and win. And if they do, kudos to them. You know, because I, I have this feeling that they're not the Islanders aren't going to lay an egg in front of their own in front of their own uh, uh, fans. Um, you know, don't quote me on that because anything is possible. But, um, you know, I could see this game, uh, this series going to game seven. And if it does go to game seven and, you know, Horvat, Barzell and Lee can can just, you know, find lightning in a bottle here for, over the next couple of games. And and, you know, who knows how far that could take them if if that continues and they, they somehow see round two, um, you know, that that's really what what they need. Right. They're getting the production from the second line they're getting Sezikis is scoring they're getting you know Matt Martin is scoring uh, um goals in in major moments like you know they have they have the pieces here to do it they yeah, just have to do still it. been a little quiet too not that he's playing poorly but on the score sheet no right yeah I mean no it, I guess it doesn't it doesn't really take all that much and I'll give the honors credit here um you expected them to t- to win at least one of their games at home. It's very, I, I the game four was maybe one of the bigger letdown games um, that I, that I've seen in a really long time. And maybe just cause it, it means a lot more in the, in the playoffs, but I'll give the Islanders a lot of credit for game five going into Carolina and, and taking that game. Um, not just because it was staying alive, but Carolina is really good at home and the Islanders were really bad at home this season. So to go in there and, and steal that game and then go home where you've played well all season after a, a gutsy victory, I don't know that I would say momentum's back on their side quite the same way after the game three victory. No. It doesn't hurt. They're definitely in good position. They know they can do it. I think you go out there, you don't worry about who's injured on the other team, that you're that you're wearing them down. You really just have to concentrate on your own game. I, I think they have not been able to do that in this series. They've let the Carolina Hurricanes, as I said earlier, kind of dictate every single part of the game. And honestly, if the power play can get going, I think that's the big part here. That's what might separate it. Because they've been, as you said, and as a lot of people have mentioned, they're controlling the five-on-five play. So if they can stay out of the box... I'm not even, I, you know, forget the penalty kill being good. Stay out of the fucking box. And then if they scored a power play goal, things might be different in this series. Have they, they've maybe scored a couple. But if, if they won, if they score one or two others, it's a different series in any one yeah. of the games. And you got to think game two is overtime, whatever you want to say about the officiating. You know, you just need to avoid that being a problem. It's well, it's they didn't get thing. they didn't get any calls in that game. They didn't get any it calls. Was... I, again, I, I am not I'm not taking any responsibility away from the refs, right? But the fact that you put yourself in the position is tough, right? If you kind it, of it, capitalize, and it's it's one thing for the, the 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 Hurricanes to come back late and maybe pull within one, similar to how Game Five shook out, and they win the game. It's another to kind of allow them to scrape back in and then let them win in overtime. And you have a list of excuses. You, you didn't have to let them, let it get to that point. And the Islanders just have not taken the reins on any of the games. Other yeah. Than so the game three for me, um, you know, just looking at how things shook out game one is really the only game where I think scoring at least one power play goal, would have made a difference because they lose the game two to one uh, game one in Carolina. They go all for four on the power play. They go, they score one goal on the power play. It's a tie game. Who knows what happens in overtime? They've been the better team five on five. Chances are goes to the Islanders Uh, game two. They don't get anything. Zero power plays. So again, question the officiating all you want. They didn't didn't get any power plays. Uh, They didn't kill enough penalties though right because the hurricanes uh scored on one of six chances so i i guess one of six isn't bad 
But you know, one goal it was the was the difference in this one. They won. Well, when you're the when you're the Islanders and you're playing low scoring games, yeah, the one is really freaking important. And I right. meant to say so, I meant to say game game one on the, the power play. I, I get you yeah. can't score in the power play if you don't have any. Although as I joked uh, last night or you know during game five that the Long Island power play is now four on four because that the Islanders were on the power play, they take a penalty yeah. and then score four on four. Uh, so maybe they, they need to just offset it there, open up the ice for Barzell and, and play a little four and four and take advantage of that. I don't know how strategically you can do that. Obviously, it's not realistic, but they seem to they stepped right up. I don't even think it took very long four and four. Uh, I think Horvat and Barzell were the first shift together uh, in, in that sequence, yeah. you know, at, at, at four and four. So it's um, it's interesting how that worked. I mean, it's no surprise that Barzell scored with a little more open ice, but um, yeah, they, they need to find a way to, to capitalize on the power play in, in game six, especially at home. They, the crowd is going to be all over them one way or another. And they have to be able to keep, keep the crowd going. If it's going to be a factor, if playing at home is going to be a factor, every part of the lineup has got to play kind of spotless hockey. And, and, Really, a big part aside from not scoring, and this is like a super oversimplification, of course. Aside from not scoring, which is going to make it really hard to win, the defense on the whole has been really bad. And then Sorokin's also not been on his game. So, like, there, there really isn't a part of the Islanders that are playing well, particularly well right now. You have Romano yeah. that's playing well here and there. Mayfield had a great sequence on that penalty kill um, that, that may have saved the game, killing like 30 or 40 seconds there. And I, yeah, which I was super surprised they let it go that long, but the refs have done crazier things this playoffs, I suppose. And then I, I'm I'm taken aback by Dobson, on I, I, and I, I do not think that I'm alone in that. I, no, it's just I'm taken aback. I am too. I just want to before you say anything about Dobson, I, I just want to point out this this one thing um, about the the power play and and, and the the goals per game here. Um, in the playoffs in, in five games, the Islanders have scored 2.8 goals per game. They've also given up 2.8 goals per game. Their power play percentage is 6.7%. Ugh. If that goes up to just 10%, which is still dreadful, they're winning this series. And again, it's That's over the, the next two games. I, I I can't stress that enough. And I I, to, I totally appreciate the perspective. They just need to do that over the next two games. Especially at home. But yeah, the, the harder obviously the harder the two is going to be at home again. I'm sorry, on the road again in Carolina. But they took the sale they took the wind out of the sails of, of the fans there. They were able to do it in that game in game five. And, and pull it out. So even if it takes that kind of victory, there's something to it. I guess they did it at the end of the day. We always say that, right? It's boring hockey. It was messy. It was ugly. It was whatever. And we don't really care unless they win. In the playoffs, it, it's a little bit different. It's, it's hard to watch. And that's why I asked the question, is it sustainable? Right. Because I, I'm struggling to see Carolina is just too good. It, you can't let a team like that continually just have chances at the chance especially when your goalie has not been your best player. And that's typically, that's typically the case for the Islanders. So again, if he wakes up for even just Friday to force game seven, they're, they're in good shape. Um, obviously it wouldn't, it wouldn't help. It would help if, you know, if the whole lineup just kind of played a, a more consistent brand of New York Islanders hockey, but um, we'll see how that shakes out. Do you have any, other thoughts. I, we kind of ran through everything pretty quick here, um, but the the threads, if if only this, you know, for the other hockey so far in the series, um, consistently inconsistent. Which I guess you can say for a lot of years with this team. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we kind of ran through the, the the major threads here. It's just been aggravating, frankly to watch. I, I think if there's anything else that I wanted to add, it's, it's, 
it's not because it's boring or anything like that. I expect that to a degree, but it's been bad. It's it's been no, like I, hard I, to watch. Yeah, I, I could understand that. Listen, no, my my takeaway from from this as a whole, right? It, it's best of two, right? Clearly, the Islanders have had difficulties with their special teams. Clearly, the Islanders have also played emotionally and and have let their emotions dictate the way these games have gone. There's two games left in the series, and as much as you might want to rip off the head of, you know, say someone on the Hurricanes like, uh, I don't know, Jesper Fast because he's in your face after the whistle, don't feed into it, Right. The, the Islanders need to play even keeled. They need to stick to their game because the, the truth of the matter is, is that their grinding style of play will wear down the Hurricanes naturally. It's just the way they play. There's no need to feed into the Hurricanes trying to draw penalties after the whistle. There's no need to draw into uh, the Hurricanes trying to lure them in to creating power play chances for themselves. Play their game. Stick to it. Right. Play the defense. Sorokin's going to stop the pucks gonna happen he'll he he is not the problem so i have seen a little bit of well sorokin's not playing like himself yeah sure it's gonna happen here and there he showed last game just why he is the goaltender for the islanders and and in my opinion i i still believe he's the best goaltender in the nhl right now um that the goaltending is going to take care of itself play well in front of him score one power play goal and they win this series I'm here for all that. I I I totally agree. Um, to close out here, did you see uh, the Jordan Everly overtime goal for the Kraken? Yeah. Bring any memories yeah. back for you? You know, I, I, it was funny. I it, somebody put it into perspective that uh, Jordan Everly is still scoring big overtime game winning goals, and Josh Bailey uh, is sitting in the press box. Both were left um, available in the in the draft. So in the in the expansion draft. Well, wasn't, Bailey, of... wasn't Bailey protected and Everly was wasn't? They were really? both unprotected. Yeah. Interesting. I don't remember that. I, don't know, I was going to say quite the same way, but I don't remember. If that's the truth, then uh, that's, I mean, I, I understand what they, what they did. I, the, the Everly thing haunts me, I think still, um, because they've been they've been trying to find somebody for Barzell, and then it's a Palmieri, and then I, it's a it's a it's a little crazy. Um, we did get a last minute question here from John Filipelli um, on on Twitter. What or who have been the biggest surprise for you during the playoff run so far? Um, uh, biggest surprise. Oh, uh, that's a good question. I, I, it could be good or bad too. I, I would say that it's probably the way Alexander Romanov has been able to come back from injury, still clearly dealing with something, but still being so effective. I think that's the biggest surprise to me, just because I also think that Barzell's dealing with something and he hasn't been as effective as Romanov has been in their respective positions. So I think the biggest surprise for me is how Romanov has uh, handled himself in the series versus how Barzell hasn't been able to replicate that effort despite both being injured and sure the nature of their injuries might be different, but I think Barzell's might be easier to deal with. I could be wrong. It, just in my opinion, the way things worked out, you know, he came back before Romanov Romanov missed game one. It seems like he's a little bit healthier, um, but Romanov has been able to assert himself a little bit more than that Barzell has. So I'm impressed with Romanov. Um, I think that's been my biggest surprise. Yeah, I think the Barzell thing is tough because he's all legs. His whole game is his speed, and even if something, as somebody that's dealing with a little bit of a leg thing and a you know a knee injury, it really does you know it, being afraid to tweak something and you you go down, you 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 turn a little bit wrong. It could just be in your head. He may be healthier. Um, but I think he just came back because he needed to come back. It was the Islanders in the playoffs. But I, it doesn't take anything away from Romanov. I think, I think that's good. And he's gotten a lot of praise, um, especially after the last game. And 
I think for me, surprises, I'll, I'll stay positive here. I, th I think it just, you have to ride that a little bit. Um, I think game five in general, it just showed what they can do. It wasn't pretty at all, but winning that game and going to game six on the island at UBS arena, I'm, I'm more confident now. They obviously needed to get there, but now thinking about a game seven after this point, it's definitely possible. And you've seen them do it against good teams where they're seemingly outmatched. Um, the thing is, they just have to bring their game. They have to bring their brand. Um, they had some of it on display uh, on Tuesday night, but they need to bring the whole package against the Canes on Friday at home if uh, they really plan on uh, on extending this thing. Even if they, you know, what the the worst case scenario is, it's 2015. Where they they win the they win game six they've won a lot of game sixes you know which is crazy to say um, over the last ten or twelve years or so they've won some game sixes and and they've pushed teams to the limits they obviously didn't win against Tampa Bay but um, they won that one against the Capitals in 2015 and then just absolutely laid an egg in game seven and again this is this the DNA has not you know there's some players have kind of come in and out, but it's been a lot of the same types of players that have come in and out. Um, and a majority of the lineups been the same, you know, save for, um, you know, obviously Tavares leaving and, and, and so on and so forth. But the, like I said, the DNA and how they play has been largely the same since probably since 2011, they just kind of figured it out and gotten better over time, but you, you can't go in there and, and, and repeat what happened eight years ago or nine years ago, whatever it was. 2015 eight years ago um you, you have to go out there and play a better game in both you, you can't you can't just win game six and then and then lay an egg you, you got to be able to use that momentum which they weren't able to do at least they weren't able to sustain it and they let the refs and the canes kind of take the energy away from them in their own building uh and it'll be a lot easier for those two elements to take over when you're not in your own building so we'll see how that all goes and um we, we'll, we're either doing a round one wrap next week or a season wrap after the next two games um so we'll catch you then any other last that, thoughts any other that, uh that was the same text i got yesterday we're either doing a season wrap or a recap <laughs> yeah well um, it could have no, been it could have been no my 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 last uh, thing here was just going back to the who was and wasn't protected back in 2021 in July. Uh, I wrote that the Islanders protected forwards Andrews Lee, Brock Nelson, JG Pajot, Matthew Barzell, Anthony Pavilier, Cal Clutterbuck, and Matt Martin. Defenseman Adam Pellick, Ryan Pullock, and Scott Mayfield, and goaltender Semyon Borlamov. Those left unprotected, the first two are Eberle and Bailey, amongst others. Crazy. Hindsight is 2020. I was pretty clear then. That's yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure there was any question at, at that point. Some good, I, you're, what are you protecting Martin? I, I, I don't understand. Like there's some of those decisions. I, I'm just not entirely. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure how you, how you do that. I am, in, I'm impressed though. And, and I guess this will be the last, last, last thing is that Bailey has not found his way in the lineup, despite the team losing. I'm impressed that they just held off on doing that because it, it would have been so easy to just switch out fashion or something. But for all the problems staying the course can can take you, and again, as you said, I, I, who there really aren't any ways to change up what the lineup is without kind of grimacing and thinking, like, that's not really the right. Who are you going to take out? Really, it's. I think it's only fashion, to be perfectly honest with you. Maybe Martin, but I doubt they want to lose that toughness in that fourth line. But um, so for all the lack of changes, uh, I'm I'm really happy that they have not relied on Josh Bailey or even Ross Johnson for some godforsaken reason in making his way back into the lineup after yeah. this. This had to be his, his, Johnson's worst uh, worst season as an Islander. He's, he's had a lot of good years and contributed well. Hey, this was not friggin' it. Um, all right. Let's wrap it up. Please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen or watch the show. 
You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Nesman Hockey. You can find James' work at the fourth period. He's covering the Devils Rangers series right now, and I'll let him uh, talk about some good news uh, after that series when, when he's ready. He doesn't have to be on the show right now. Uh, and make sure to subscribe to Isles Fix for every post game. Uh, you know, the next morning they have a newsletter. I think even on off days they have they're they're doing newsletters. So make sure you subscribe and support that team over there. James, bring us home for Game Six. Until next time, all. Let's go Islanders. <laughs>